All right, we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. Welcome um, uh, to this Cancer Health Disparities and Equity uh, lecture, the first in, um, in what will be an ongoing series that um, uh, is very exciting for the Duke Cancer Institute, for our disparity spore, for all of our outreach, um, equity, and community engagement programs. So we're very excited that you're all here with us. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Lourdes Bezaconda Garbanati. Uh, Lourdes and I um, um, were on the platform together at a disparities meeting in Puerto Rico a few months ago. Uh, I was utterly amazed at the talk that she gave, even though it was uh, it was quite short. And I just wanted everybody to hear about the amazing work that she's been doing. Uh, she is an associate dean for community initiatives at the Keck School of Medicine at uh, USC in Los Angeles. She's also Associate Director for Community Outreach and Engagement at the Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Southern California. She's a professor in Population and Public Health Sciences and Director for the Center of Health Equity uh, in the Americas. She's co-principal investigator of a community scholars collaborative on health equity, uh, uniting 10 uh, a 10 school collaborative that spans multiple disciplines from cinema to social work to population and public health sciences, engineering, religious life, journalism, and communication. She chairs the board of directors for the National Alliance uh, for Hispanic Health, uh, supporting the All of Us One Million Individual Research Program uh, from the NIH. She's an expert in cancer disparities research with diverse populations in developing culturally specific, effective cancer prevention interventions and engaging uh, at-risk populations in community-based particip participatory research. Her research has helped to shape the way scientific information is communicated to diverse populations. She's been a voice for inclusion, outreach, and engagement of community opinion leaders and underserved communities um, in disparities research for, for many uh, for many decades. Um, she has over 200 publications uh, in prestigious journals, including the American Journal for Public Health. Uh, she has many awards uh, from the state of California, the city of Los Angeles. In 2018, she was recognized by the state of California um, uh, for her contributions to the elimination of health disparities um, in Los Angeles, particularly, uh, uh, and then um, has played a huge role in uh, the city's response uh, to COVID. So um, we're just absolutely delighted. She's also uh, a recipient. Uh, uh, um, so she and I are uh, together as co -recip as recipients of the AACR's um, Distinguished uh, Researcher in Cancer Disparities. And so we've known each other from that platform and uh, from our time in Puerto Rico. And so um, Dr. Bezaconda, the, the mic is yours. And we're excited to hear from you today. Thank you, Steve. Can you all hear me well? Yes, we can. Great. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and for all of you who were able to join us this morning. Um, what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing um, at USC to really address cancer and other disparities. And I'm going to, um, in particular, mm -hmm. talk about three primary educational frameworks that we utilize um, through participatory processes and community engagement uh, with CBPR, community-based participatory research. Um, also, uh, I do a lot of cancer communication work. And so we utilize the frameworks of edutainment and environmental cues. And I will go into that in, in a few minutes. And then I'm gonna present to you several of our model programs for how we've chosen rather innovative ways of communicating health information to these vulnerable communities. And so you'll see various examples of what we do as you know, no, there's nothing that fits everybody, but there might be something that might be interesting that maybe you could capture from here that could be usable in your populations. So this is our, our structure within our community outreach and engagement at the Cancer Center. Dr. Karen Lerman is our director, and we have a community advisory board composed of uh, different individuals, each with their own 
um, sort of survivorship story. They're all cancer survivors and they all represent the main uh, key cancer or priority cancers that our cancer center is working on. And then Dr. Mariana Stern leads an internal advisory committee, which is composed of members of all the programs within the cancer center. And they also are very actively involved with regular meetings in the decision-making um, along with our community advisory board, which they join in meetings together. This is what the makeup of our um, staff looks. We um, really feed and leverage a lot of um, foundation grants as well as other NIH grants, just, such as the National Outreach Network uh, of Community Health Educators. And so we have a very varied group, as you could see, to really meet the needs of the very diverse Los Angeles. So this is a population by race and ethnicity and federal poverty here in California. And you know we really have a very, very large percentage of the Latino population, um, which is represented throughout, and especially in LA, it's about 49%. And then we have smaller numbers, but still significant to us of Asian Pacific Islanders, as well as of African Americans and other groups. So there is one of the centers I wanted to mention to you is a center, uh, the Southern California Center for Latino Health, which is um, one of the centers that we work with within the Cancer Center. And this is an initiative with Children's Hospital Los Angeles, really to tackle the uh, obesity uh, situation in California and in Los Angeles in particular. And so we work with a coalition of universities as well as of community-based organizations in addressing some of the issues of sugar beverages. And we have on March 18th, for example, we're gonna have a big event where we're going to air a film called El Susto. And that is about how people are scared about this sugar um, a pandemic in many ways, because it's worldwide. Um, this is really to tackle, um, you know, some of the issues that we've been seeing in terms of race and ethnicity uh, related to, um, you know, differences in, in, in dis and disparities that exist. Um, so you could see uh, on the left, the death rate by ethnicity, and then you could see the life expectancy on, on the right. And so, you know, we're very concerned about our black brothers and sisters, which seem to have, you know, fare worse in terms of life expectancy um, for many, many different areas, including cancer. One area of cancer that I focus on quite a bit is on cervical cancer. So a lot of my research is done on cervical cancer, and I'm gonna show you some examples of how we've intervened related to cervical cancer. Uh, especially we see large differences in the Hispanic population, uh, both in, in Los Angeles as well as in the U.S. But in, in L.A., we have major problems and we have women coming in um, at age 40 with very advanced disease. So that's really a very large concern to us and something that we've tried to tackle uh, as well. You can see here the cancer mortality also with the non-Hispanic whites not faring very well in terms of cancer mortality. And you can see here, um, cervical cancer screening. I, I like to show this slide because that darker blue uh, is a higher percentage of cancer screening. And in the last seven years, we've seen that blue um, change from very light to darker. And we like to think that we have had something to do with it in terms of intervening in cervical cancer. And then we'll tell you how the magic works. So part of the magic of how we've really developed some of our interventions, as Steve mentioned, we work with the USC School of Cinema, as well as the Annenberg School for Communication. And, and together we've worked on what is called edutainment, uh, really to accelerate the translation from discovery to delivery so that the information that we have, we can get it out into the communities in a much uh, faster pace. Um, and uh, edutainment um, is really something at the intersection of education and entertainment. So it really, the term was first used by Walt Disney in 1954. So, so, so that starts to put you in that kind of a frame that, you know, we're not here just to do educational videos, but also 
to entertain folks as we do them. And so we know that the traditional educational videos do work, but some things work better than, than, than that. So we set out to, to understand, um, you know, sort of what is happening. Uh, how come, you know, we, we're seeing that they're not being these changes that we want to make as much as we'd like to make them. So we set out to challenge the assumption that the traditional recitation of facts like we do with talking heads and things like that is really the optimal way to convey health information. And so we sent in for a, a transformative R01, which comes out of the um, NCI director's office. And we were able to receive the funding and we started our proposal and I'll ask you, why did Pinocchio's nose grow? So if you know why Pinocchio's nose grow, that came to you really fast. But do you remember the name of your third grade teacher and one significant fact that she taught you? Some of you might. I remembered Mr. Varney, my third grade teacher. I can't remember a thing he taught me, but I do remember him. I do remember why Pinocchio's nose grew really immediately. And so why? what's the difference? The difference is that we learned about Pinocchio in a storytelling way. And storytelling is at the base of many of our cultures are very, very much engrossed in, into storytelling. So we set out with an experiment where we used a narrative or a storytelling way versus a non-narrative, uh, which was more fact-based. And we did this experiment with funding from the NIH. The one on the left is the narrative, and yes, we do show a chicken um, to explain to people how a pap is done. And then we also use the more traditional way. And this is the traditional film where I'm not gonna show, but I'm gonna show you our tamale lessons. Oh, hold on there. This is our narrative. Okay, it's true. You mainly get HPV from sex, but so what? You're 21 and you should get yourself checked out. Checked out for what? A pap test? What's a pap test? Nothing. Hey. I got all my things too. I'm about to be a woman. You're about to be 15. That's quite a woman. Petra got married when she was 15. And I was too young. <laughs> Why are you going to have a pap test? Yes, that's what they're talking about while they're making tamales. And you believe this? Well, every woman should know about pap tests. Why are you promoting your sister? She doesn't need to know about those things. Yes, she does. Do you want her to get cancer? Who's talking about cancer? We can get cancer down there. Yes, but I not like here. She's a virgin. Pop tests are not just for women who have sex. Um, hey, do you know women from 21 to 60, they should get checked at least every two years. And if you're sexually active, you should get checked more often. About 50% of the women have this virus. How many? Yes, and if you don't get checked, you can get cervical cancer and can spread all over your body and you could die. You should get yourself checked, Petra. My husband is dead. Why would I need a Baptist? Who has the time or the money? It's not that expensive. It's an easy checkup. Plus, I hear women your age. I ain't that old. <laughs> I'm just saying, you're on the higher risk. Plus, it's very easy. You don't even have to go to a hospital. You can go to the clinic on Central, and it's free. Does it hurt? Um, no, not really. Just like a mosquito bite like that. Ow, <laughs> man. It's embarrassing. And it's probably uncomfortable. No, it's more like this. Okay, when you go to the doctor, you sit on the table, and they spread your legs like... This. Oh, and what exactly does the doctor do? Okay, so let's pretend your vagina. Uh, Dr. Lord, we lost sound. Lords, we lost the sound. For somehow, oh. for some reason. All of yourselves. Are you okay now? Yes. I just didn't have bleeding down there. Hey, Mia, are you still having that problem? And that's all? Yeah. 
you find out right away if you have a problem? No. Usually, yeah, no, it takes like uh What, you do the test and then they send it to the lab and uh, you probably get the results like... So I'm, I'm going to stop it there, um, but it's uh, we have uh, multiple versions of the film. Um, the film was developed based on 12 focus groups with um, Hispanic women, mostly of Mexican origin. However, we did test it with European Americans and African Americans. And we found, as you can see here, and you know, at, at NCI, everything is about impact. So we tested the impact of this, um, that uh, we had a much larger percentage of those who viewed the film in the narrative format, who either made an appointment to get a PAP or had had a PAP um, in the last six months since the intervention. Um, and so what you see was that we were able to uh, reduce a disparity within a six month period uh, that we were seeing at our hospital mostly. And um, this was with about a thousand women. And so we literally were able to begin the elimination of that disparity um, through this kind of intervention. And of course, the other film did good well, did well too. It's not like it did terrible, but compared to the narrative, people six months later still remember the chicken and they were you know, trying to figure out, okay, I need to go get um, screened. So that kind of tells you, I mean, I don't know how many people are gonna remember me stating all the facts, for example but they will remember the chicken. So now I'm known as the chicken lady. So that tells you kind of how that goes. So, but I, I wanna say that it's not that we're sending everybody to go make a video. That's not what we mean, because there has to be three major elements that the video has to have. One is transportation. That means that people need to be truly transported into the storyline, really absorbed by the storyline. The other one is identification, that they identify with one or more of the characters and the story and what is happening with that character and their lives. And the other one is that it elicits some kind of an emotion, whether it's a positive or a negative or any other kind of emotion. So in our focus groups, we learned from the women that they didn't wanna be kind of um, chastised because they were concerned about the sexual activity related to the potential disease or their husband's sexual activity that they may have contracted the HPV from. And so they didn't wanna be hearing that. They didn't wanna hear another terrible, sad story. So hence why we tried to go with the more humor uh, side with the emotion and still were able to convey uh, an important message that had a, a long lasting effect. So, so that was one of our, um, you know, edutainment. That is edutainment at its best. Uh, and then we aired that, and right now that we work a lot in Latin America, it's being used in 900 jurisdictions throughout Latin America um, as a video. We've had to do some updates because the guidelines change, and they also change by country. But, you know, that tells you the potential for this. So we decided to use another method of um, education, which is um, using environmental cues. That means that the the environment is what results as a reminder uh, for some health messages. So in Los Angeles, between April and June, we have the blooming of this absolutely gorgeous tree called the Hakaranda. And so this is what the tree looks like. So we decided to exploit the blooming of this beautiful tree as an environmental cue to remind women to either get their kids vaccinated against HPV or is it time for you to get checked now again? And so that is the, the reminder. So how did we do this? So what we did was that we worked with the um, Design Matters program at the Pasadena College of Art and Design. And we worked with our Promotoras de Salud, community health workers, and, and with a team of uh, investigators and scientists uh, from the Cancer Center. And Together, we came up with this outdoor media campaign and an indoor media campaign. The outdoor media campaign is composed of lampposts, um, uh, billboards, and bus benches, where we put out this message. And the message is, es importante, es fácil, es tiempo. It's important, it's easy, it's time to get your either your pap smear, 
pap smear or to get your kids vaccinated. And then we also, um, we never got to use the bus advertisement because it got expensive, but all the other elements we were able um, to utilize. And we also developed a toolkit that we worked with clinics in Los Angeles and mainly Las Clinicas Monseñoros Carromero, which are around our campus and also a little bit farther, we have another one of those clinics to also utilize the images and the and the messaging in their clinics, putting it in their uh, hallways as well as in the exam rooms and for people, the promotoras also to follow up. So what we found, we had a control clinic and we did an intervention clinic. Our Boyle Heights clinic, which is close to USC, was our intervention clinic. And then we had another clinic in Pico Union, which is a bit further, where there was no intervention. And what you could see was a 13 point significant difference in the number of women who came in to be screened. And then we also sent an additional group of women that had been kind of, you know, not, they had not been in for any kind of um, exams or anything in, in the last five years. So we sent them a postcard. And we also saw um, a, a 30 some difference in terms of these women coming in. But remember, all of this is happening simultaneously. They are seeing the community that they live in filled with these posters. They have the blooming of the tree and they also have um, the signage at the clinics that they go to. And the signage was everywhere, all around the city, all at the same time. And so we were able to see the, again, you know, and see, I like impact. So we were able to see the impact of the campaign we were doing out in the community um, in terms of, you know, really going back to the medical records of these people that were part of these clinics and being able to prove that they had gotten their, um, you know, that they had gotten their PAPs. So now we're working on trying to get messaging more to younger populations, um, you know, because we know they start at nine and working with the Neighborhood Academic Initiative, which is a program of 15 different schools in low income Los Angeles on this. Um, we're also trying to distribute information through our wellness hubs about um, cervical cancer and about other cancers as well. So we're out in the community doing tables almost every week, if not two to three times a month, uh, <clears throat> just to bring the information on cancer straight right into the communities. We have our laptops, we play our videos during that time as well. And so those are some of the things that we've done to date um, in terms of cancer. And I'll stop here for a few uh, minutes to see if there are any questions. And if you could just speak up, because I don't see everybody on my screen. So if you have a question, please just speak up. Um, Lords, is the uh, tamale lesson um, available online? Is yes, it, it is. Okay. You just put a tamale lesson USC. Make sure you put USC on it, or you're going to get a tamale recipe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that might be okay too. But yeah. uh, it would be great to be able to um to to have access to that. Sure, it's available through YouTube, and you can. It ha there's an 11 minute and a three minute version. So okay. depending on what you want to do, and then note that um some of the guidelines have changed in terms. So what we do right now is that we're trying to edit the video, but in the meantime, if you want to use it, just stop it at that point and provide information on the new guidelines. Okay. Great. Any other questions for Dr. Bezaconda? I have a question. Did you use postcards because it's an evidence-based intervention or was there another reason in using the postcards? We, we did use the postcards because that was the, they told us the best way to get um, to the women directly to their home. And we, and we created absolutely gorgeous postcards uh, were glossy and everything so that they would be harder to throw away, <laughs> you know, because they, you know, people will throw stuff away just because, you know, we accumulate too much stuff. And then they came from the clinic itself. And so they knew that it was a message from their clinic that was coming to them. And so that also had a little bit of a bearing, especially in the Hispanic community where they do trust a lot more their doctors than in other communities. And so that, that made a difference. It really has to be a trusted source that the information is coming through. So we've also explored, like, for example, when the work we do in Panama, 
we go through community-based organizations. So it's the community-based organization that, that they trust that tells them, we understand that you have not come in for screening and we really wanna encourage you to do that. And so, you know, it, 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 it has to be adapted to the specific groups and, and you know, and, and cultural values in that group. I love it, great idea. Thank you. So now I want to tell you, like all of us, we everybody had to pivot, right, during the COVID pandemic. So I'm going to tell you a few of the things that we did during COVID, um, just because I think that these are potential examples of other different kinds of things that can be done. Um, you know, I, I love coming into work every day. I get excited about this, uh, the work that we're doing. You know, and 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 it's like you know we really can see that we're helping people and and changing lives. And I think that you know we also did that during during COVID, and that was a uh, really key for us because what we found was that you know as as you all know, COVID was really impacting our African American and our Latino communities more than many other communities at the time, and that we were really seeing that a lot of people couldn't really stay home. They were in the middle of, of the pandemic as much as we were, but they were some of the service workers that really needed to, to be out there uh, providing the services that we needed. We found a lot of food insecurity, residential instability. Los Angeles has a huge homeless problem. People living in their cars became even more prevalent. And, and then we started seeing, you know, because many in our communities, not just you know, have cancer, but they could also have diabetes or heart disease. We tend to have comorbidities. And then on top of that, if you are at risk for COVID or you get COVID, then we saw so many deaths related to that. So, so we decided to go out with, we already had done the storytelling uh, with the tamale lesson and we had done a sample. So we knew that those were two methods that worked. So, um, excuse me. Sorry about that. So essentially what we did was utilize these two methodologies that we knew had worked for us um, to then come in and, and, and do the work on COVID that we needed to do. So we produced a video called Happy Birthday Granny, which was a six minute video. And um, that can be found in vaccinatela.info. Um, and you can go there and look at short films. And we produced actually three videos. And we also produced 48 very, very, very short 30 second videos sharing your why with doctors from the community. So we went out into the community to talk to the doctors, to talk to the people themselves and have all that taped and then utilize it as part of our interventions. In addition to that, we produce a fotonovela, which is very common in the Latino community. And the fotonovela was about, was, was in tune with our another short film called uh, uh, Reasons and Rumors that we did. And so this and, and the fotonovela were in tune with each other, uh, really conveying messages. And here we really did a lot of cultural tailoring because the messaging that resonated in the African-American community about COVID was very different than that which was resonating in the Hispanic community. So there were issues of trust, uh, fear of the effectiveness of the vaccine, how quickly it had been made. And so those were universal themes. But then there were very, very unique themes into each one. One was, you know, what, you know, how do we trust this vaccine? And other, you know, is this a way that I'm going to be tracked because I'm, I'm not documented or something? And, you know, or they're going to put a chip in me of some kind. And so also um, in the Latino community, lots of issues about fertility and infertility that were very, very primary into people not wanting to get their kids vaccinated. And so, so we had to address, so each film, and I'm not gonna show each film just for the sake of time, because we have other things I wanna tell you about, but go to Vaccinate LA, go to short films, and you'll see all the films there. And then in the section that says, share your why, you'll able to see you know, some of the doctors, um, like this physician here, uh, who really you know, tackled some of these issues. Dr. John Carpton, for example, was one of the key persons that helped us to address some of these issues as well. And so we produced um, uh, later another video that's not there, but I have that um, for you if you need it on clinical trials with Dr. Carpton uh, speaking out, you know, in, in terms of the needs for that. So now we utilize this methodology with the very short videos to put out 
um, as well as with the films when you have more time and you're in that kind of a setting. Um, another thing that we did during the pandemic was that we literally sent community vaccine navigators, which were our promotores de salud, door to door. So you remember, remember the time in the pandemic, you know, sometime June of 2020, when, you know, people weren't sure what was going on. They had so many questions. So we're sending promotores out to answer questions at people's homes. People were terrified of coming out and we had a lot of shut in elderly. Later, we send our promotores out once the vaccines were available because, oh my God, I have a PhD and I had a hard time signing up for my vaccine. So imagine what many of our um, individuals we work with, especially when they didn't speak the language. So the promotores actually were there to help them sign up. Um, some of them didn't have an email that they could return to. And so they were provided with a phone um, so that they could you know, get their appointment. And then we would track down what their landline was so that we could call them when their appointment was due on their landline because the system was made only for cell phones and some of our people don't have them. So through the promotoras, we were able to make a huge difference. The program went, um, you know, people heard about it and I talked about it at the National Alliance for Hispanic Health. So they got a grant from the HRSA, um, Health Research Service Administration. And through that grant, we were able to train about 400 women and men um, throughout the country in 38 different cities. And we were able to achieve um, about 6 million consultations that were done related to COVID and actually were instrumental in getting 250,000 people vaccinated. And so, you know, these things work. That's the thing, they, they actually do work. And, you know, and, but you've got to put the energy and you've got to have the right kind of people. And you have to have people that are from those communities because, you know, it, it's not like, if you know Mary shows up, you know where Juan lives, yeah, he may not be too happy. But if Juanito shows up with Juan, then you know that's a whole different uh, dynamics. And so, so we need to really work and engage the people from those communities. And we did that. And you know some of the good things um, that happened. We produced this video, and this video um, is to one of the programs. I'm going to show it. It's, it's under a minute, and. What's good about this is that we also utilize the learning from the Estiempo campaign. Remember, we talked about you know doing the billboards and all that kind of stuff. So we we took all of that learning and then we worked with eleven artists in the Latino community. Many of them muralists who were famous for the murals in LA. If you've ever been to LA, LA is just famous for its murals. And so working with them, we produce messaging about preserving life and how to best mitigate um, you know, the, the behaviors related to COVID. So I'm gonna show this video so you could see um, in motion uh, how we implemented this campaign and, and, you know, and out in the streets of Boyle Heights. Might need, might need the sound, Lords. Oh. Can you hear it? No. No? Okay, let me see what's going on here. Okay, well, I'm not sure why the sound is not playing here. It's really catchy music. Um, oh. and you can see, can you at least, can you see the images at least? Yes. Okay. We can see the images. We just can't hear the sound, yeah. but it's music. It, it's it, mostly it, music or is it a voice? It's, it's all music. It's all music. Okay. Um, yeah, I could sing it for you. No, I'm just kidding. That's all right. We'll use our imagination. <laughs> so it's like, da, 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 da. that's the kind of music you're going to hear. It's sort of like really, you know, um, melodic and, and just very Spanish style. So um, I regret you can't hear it. I'm going to try in the meantime, but I'll keep playing it.
So these are the billboards out in the eastern part of Los Angeles and the bus benches. These are our partners that we worked with. As you can see, it really takes a lot of people to pull some things like this off. And these were created by one of our community workers um, in the community. And so we did a whole um, bunch of those kinds of, I'm sorry, let me try. And so these were the two major um, sort of images that were in the community. Um, as you can see on the left, you have people with mixed status, which happened a lot uh, in terms of being vaccinated or not being able to be vaccinated. At the time, kids couldn't be vaccinated yet, and some of the elderly were afraid of being vaccinated. So our messaging, and this was all produced by Latino artists in the community, and we did town halls and everything to perfect these images so that they could accept them in their own communities. We didn't wanna, you know, I'd hate somebody to come and put a big painting in my living room. So we figured we need their involvement. So through town hall meetings, um, the, the artists were part of the town hall meetings along with the people in the community, really perfecting these images to make them what they wanted them to be. And then we aired them for a few months out in the, in the community. Here's one of the billboard postings that we had. You can see it's right in the local market. And you can see that there are other um, images um, there as well. Um, and then we had kids from the different neighborhood programs that we work with uh, develop uh, vaccination messaging once the kids were able to get vaccinated. And so th this, this image was developed by one of our kids. Um, and so we did that and then we did an art exhibit, which was a digital art exhibit, which was all done virtually. And if you go to our stayconnectedla.com, you could see the art exhibit um, and you could see the artists we work with. And then we were able to air all of the images that the kids had developed, but virtually, because remember, we couldn't be anywhere with people. But the thing is that we've learned so much about the use of Zoom and the use of you know, um, virtual uh, types of things now that we're excited about how we can maximize and have multiple ways of reaching people. It doesn't have to be just, you know, direct one-on-one -on -one information. So one of the um, great things about this is that we were able to get people in the community uh, to at least get um, to their first dose. And we found that in those intervention communities that we worked in, uh, we had much higher levels of people getting at least the first dose of the vaccine than you did in the general population in, in, of Latinos in, in Los Angeles and in LA County in particular. So there was a difference because of our intervention, you know, and it was quite intense. It had the promotoras and it had these other aspects as, as well. Um, and so at the sa same time, we're doing media outreach um, through social media using Instagram, uh, Facebook. We had Facebook chats. Uh, we had different issues that we had addressed, um, and, you know, we had a Twitter account. This uh, man here on the left is Freddie Muse, who's actually the chair of our advisory cap, of our advisory committee. So we, you know, it's not all about me, it's about them and it's about our communities. And so we really get the message out with uh, a lot of the folks that work with us. Um, the African-American and African Nationals Clinical Trials Manual was the one that I'm saying where John Carpton really helped us tremendously. And, you know, he appears um, here, you could do a link and John's video will appear on that as well. And I can, you can access all of these toolkits through our Cancer Center website and our outreach and engagement um, section. So everything is, is there if you have that. And if you don't find it, call me and I'll make, or text me or email me and I'll make sure that you get it. So we use a lot of the social media as well in disseminating educational materials. We um, started during the pandemic, this Adelante program, which was all um, trying to target women who had had breast cancer um, and who needed to maintain an exercise level to be able to do so um, online. And so we you know, even produced this like online kind of exercise. And now I'm really excited because I've never done this. I've uh, you know, it's just something new, we're just testing things, but we're starting to use virtual reality as a mechanism to get people engaged in cancer education and information. Also, 
um, some of the ways that we have seen it used in the past and that we're thinking about, not that we've done it yet, but we really are engaged in trying to figure all this out is to, especially with all of our immigrant populations, who everybody wants to go home one last time, especially if they're at, at, with a very late stage disease, but we know that they won't be able to. And so what we're trying to do is to produce a virtual reality experience from their childhood with pictures, with talking to people in their own countries, with things here, areas that we could produce that they could view um, you know, because they, they really won't be able to go back home. So we have a class that's working on this for us right now. Um, in the future, I'll be able to tell you how uh, the progress has been, but, but this is something that we're looking into, you know, how do we bring uh, some kind of dignity and, and respect to, especially to some of our end of life patients um, as well um, through these new and, you know, virtual mechanisms. And then just to end, um, one of the other things that we've been doing is really working on policy issues. So we have um, developed a Latino policy platform for reducing the toll of tobacco in the Latino community. And we work with eight regional centers throughout all of California. We've been able to pass with that and with the help of our coalitions, seven different uh, flavor bans um, in California. And so we've been very active um, in terms of doing that and then really training um, our, our young people and our communities to be advocates um, uh, you know, for themselves and their communities on these issues. And we support them um, in, in, in what they do as well. So I just wanna thank all of our community partners and that have really engaged in this very active and participatory process. I think since the pandemic, I you know, was working 15 to 17 hour days. So now my 13, 14 hour days seem like I'm on vacation. But, um, you know, but it's, it's just been a, a huge amount of work, but it's just been incredibly exciting. And I'll stop here, stop sharing um, to see if there are any questions. So Lords, there's a, um, there's a, a, a question from Sarah Weaver. I'd love to hear more about the process of finding these talented artists. How did you make connections within your institution? How did you advertise and involve the community in the youth art project and the town hall? So um, that 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 relates to actually what was going to be my first question. Um, just elaborate a little bit on how how did you build these collaboratives and these coalitions of people who came together and. And, uh, you know, and then and what are the what are the difficulties that also need to be managed when you do that? Yeah, absolutely. We can't romanticize it all. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's really taken us about 20 years to get to this point in terms of winning the trust of the communities. Um, you know, at USC, there's been a major, major effort to become an anchoring institution for the community. And that has been even, uh, you know, preceding me coming on board. And so, so first of all, is that the institution is known as a trusted source of information. And so that is really key. So we go out there, it's not like, you know, we're just, you know, some kind of random person or someone who doesn't have all the information. So I'll give you one example of how you've built, we've built that trust. Um, our dean used to have what was called uh, Dean's Corner. And every Saturday, she had an open forum where we would invite, sometimes we'd have up to 800 people come, especially during the pandemic, where she would be answering questions. She'd get panels of experts over um, just to be that voice of some sort of sanity during the time that information kept changing and things were coming at us so fast and people no longer knew what to trust. And so we were there. And, and, and so that you know, started building that trust. And so it came all the way from the very top. It wasn't just the cancer center, it was all the way to the Dean's office and our president's office. And so in that sense, it builds a foundation of trust in that. It is that foundation that we're able to walk into you know, to really do more of the work and build that capacity, both within our investigators as well as in the community. So we really believe in this concept of bi-directionality. We live this concept all the time in bringing communities and our tabs together 
to really um, talk about their issues and then meet with our investigators, even with our basic scientists. So um, just about a month ago, we held a fairly large um, executive leadership meeting with our CAB members. So all the leaders of the Cancer Center were meeting with our CAB members to talk to them and for them to talk to our leaders about what were the priorities, what were the issues that people are facing. And then we take those and we really act on them in new and innovative ways. In terms of the actors and things like that, we work very closely with the Yannenberg School of Communication and the USC Cinema School. Uh, Jeremy Kagan and Sheila Murphy have been two collaborators in that space um, that um, Jeremy, for example, he's a filmmaker, he's a Hollywood producer, but he also is part of the USC School of Cinematic Arts. And so we engage students, many of them are our own students, many of those faces are our own students that are engaged in doing that. Some of them are our own community members, like you saw Freddie Muse probably 10 times because he loves this part, um, and our investigators. We don't put all investigators out, not all of them have the charm and the, uh, you know, sort of like ability to do this, but, but we try to train them on how to uh, speak in a lay language, you know, about complex uh, findings. Just yesterday, I met with two basic scientists um, who are doing research on pancreatic cancer. And, you know, and so we were discussing what are ways in which they, as basic scientists, can really promote some of the work they're doing in the community. And we decided we're gonna have some community tours where communities are gonna be able to come in and look through the microphone and get things explained in lay language. And so we're constantly trying to build those relationships. I go to more birthday parties, more quinceañeras, unfortunately, a lot of funerals. We, we go, we're, we're there. Um, there's been shootings here in LA in, Monterey Park, we just had a shooting. That same weekend, our entire workforce from our COE was out there um, at the Lunar New Year Festival because we wanted to show them because you're scaring now, we're here for you. You know, and so so we are we try to live the life of the communities that we work in. Uh, we hire from those communities as well. Many of our actors are either our students or they are also community people. And occasionally we have hired and paid actors. So in Tamali Lesson, the lady with the curlers, Petra, she's a hired actress that, that we hired for that role. But other people are people that we train, that we work with, and that you know um, have, have a knack for this. Because not everybody does, but if they do and they want to do it. And, and we do pay our community workers and everyone um, for, for their work. So it takes time to build that, but it's part of being that presence in the community. Mm -hmm. Two other questions came up. How did you make the connection to research? For example, with the Tamale lesson, you went back and asked, you know, whether or not it improved anything. Was that more related to working with the clinics or did you go back and actually talk to individual people? And then Dr. Eplane asked, um, what did you find to be the most effective methods for disseminating these video videos? Um, so we we did go back. We we actually applied for money from NIH um, so that we could test the video, and so we got funding to do uh, an experimental type of um, you know with a control video and an intervention video. Um, so we try to in, implement the evaluation pieces right from the beginning. Um, that's really important for us, especially with NCI really pushing for impact. Uh, we can't no longer produce, we don't feel we can, you know, just stuff and that we put out and we just hope it works, you know, um, and that we need to test it and make sure that it is evidence-based. And so we have to go out and get additional funds sometimes. Sometimes the CTSI, for example, in our, um, at USC will fund some programs because some of them are not expensive to do necessarily, um, and some are a little bit more. So, so that was one way that we did that. And I'm sorry, your last question was? Um, uh, methods for disseminating the videos oh, themselves. Sure, so um, certainly through social media, but also working with the county departments, 
of public health. So in LA, we work with the LA County Department of Public Health and we work with 68 different county health departments in California. And so we find that, you know, as long as they approve the messaging. So we had, for example, in COVID, we worked with the Department of Education in our messaging, but they did not want to use a message in the schools that was only one ethnicity specific. They wanted a multicultural video. So we produced a video called Team Lab. It's also in vaccinatela.info, which is geared towards kids and it's completely multicultural. Uh, so that then that way the school system could feel that they could air it because their school systems are very multicultural. So we work through those big organizations as well as our community partners. And our community partners are essential in that. And then we use social media, you know, little nippets, little tinny derivatives of it, you know, TikTok, um, different ones. And well, we may not be able to use TikTok anymore, who knows? But, you know, all these other ones that we can, you know, we put those out as well um, through social media so that they reach multiple audiences. Not everybody's on social media in our communities. Um, you know, we've even produced, you know, phone text messaging that we could send out uh, to, to folks because everybody does have a phone, even if it's a pay as you go phone. Well, now I understand why you were working 17 hours a day and why you think 14 hours a day is a vacation. Because <laughs> you're managing these coalitions of people, you're probably on everybody's speed dial. And they probably, <laughs> every time they need an answer, they probably call you. And that's, that's, that's taxing. That's a lot of work. Uh, it, it is a lot of work, but I have a big team. So, you know, our team through grants and support from um, Karen at the Cancer Center and through other means, uh, you know, philanthropy. I have to tell you, the, the work in philanthropy, as you well know, Steve, is, is really critical. We have had donors that have really given us funds that we can use more openly without too many strings attached. During COVID, we had a donor that gave us funds to pay for uh, cancer patients who were dying from COVID to pay for funerals, to pay for their rent. Um, to pay for food, uh, you know, yes. those are needs that our communities have that you can't go to NIH and give you the money for, yeah. but the donors, that donor pool, uh, God bless them, you know, they have been instrumental in bringing the life, you know, into these programs and really being there for the community. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lords. That was amazing. Uh, the, the creativity quotient is off the charts in what you've done uh, to reach your community. And uh, I, I just continue to be wowed by what you've done and the impact that you've had. Oh, and sure. uh, uh, this was very exciting and very much appreciated.